This morning we come to the end of our series on the Psalms and uh, if you hadn't worked out already the Sons of Korah are a Christian music group who uh, write music to the Psalms without trying to paraphrase it or fit it into some metric way and I thought it would be good um, sometime during this series to hear uh, one of their songs so we use that for the reading of Psalm 139. A psalm which I'm sure for many of us here is a favourite. Um, presents some amazing, uh, wonderful images of God knowing us, forming us, weaving us together like a wonderful, intricate, detailed tapestry in our mother's womb. And for some of our folk here, perhaps particularly the mums and the mums in waiting, there's a few of them, and even for those who have suffered pain and loss and difficulty in childbirth, this psalm can give us great comfort knowing that God knows our days, that he forms them for us and forms us for them, for our days, whether they be many or few. And we can take great heart in this psalm, even in that context of pain and suffering, the heartache of situations such as miscarriage or stillbirth or difficulties in childbirth. Because in this psalm, those days and the wonderful works of the Lord from his viewpoint and therefore for ours begin not on the day we're born but actually when we're made in the secret hidden place. Even our unformed substance, the very embryo of our being is seen and formed by the Lord. And so I pray this morning without taking anything away from that wonder and that appreciation, that adoration of God and his perfect forming of us adding to that comfort and those images and truths that we might come to see and know that God knows us completely and that in that knowledge he longs for us and has done everything necessary that we might come to know him. Just as this psalm presents God forming us in the most wonderful way, this psalm itself is formed quite wonderfully. There's four verses or stanzas. Each, uh, we'll call them stanzas because then there's six verses in each. Verse 1 to 6, verse 7 to 12, 13 to 18 and so on. And you'll see that each stanza begins with a summary statement saying what, the, what David the psalmist wants to say and then he develops that or it gives an exposition or example and then with a concluding thought which also acts as a transition to the next stanza. Three of these stanzas contain David's meditation upon God, his absolute knowledge of David, his inescapable presence and his divine and detailed creative work and power in forming him, even from his mother's womb, even before then. And then the final stanza which you might have noticed the sons of Korah omitted and we might see why when we get there, involves two responses from David in light of his meditation, his own conclusion and personal conviction <coughs> formed from his knowledge of God's knowledge of him. So let's look at the psalm. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. That's the theme for this first stanza and for the entire psalm. The Lord knows David. He knows each of us. He has searched me and known me. The word search here is not like someone looking for something that, or someone who is lost, although that would fit nicely with Jesus coming to seek and save the lost, wouldn't it? It's not the picture here. The searching here equates with testing and examining, investigating. And the knowing here is not some mere intellectual mind type of knowledge. This is close, personal and active knowledge. We often speak of God's knowledge using one of those big theological words, one of the, the many omnis, his omniscience. But sometimes using that word can make us think purely academically and theologically. That is not the knowledge that's here. It is his omniscience, but scripture uses that word knowledge in a whole lot of different ways. For knowing a piece of information or the whereabouts of somebody, to the Lord in the early chapters of Exodus, knowing the sufferings of his people not knowing about them or knowing of them, but actually knowing them, that compassion, that with suffering, suffering with, he knows their sufferings. 
and even to something far more personal and intimate where Adam and others, but Adam, particularly in Genesis, knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. This knowledge is intimate and it's personal, it's close, it's active. And this knowledge includes the scrutiny that comes with close and detailed searching and exposure, having been searched by the Lord. And so David goes on to expound what it means to have been searched and known by the Lord. And he does this by using a whole bundle of opposites, when I sit down to when I rise up, my path, my going out and my lying down. And within those opposites, the extremes from one to the other, where to include everything in between, God knows it all. When I sit down and when I rise up and every move I make in between, sitting down and standing up, God knows. The path, the ways that I go and where I stay, God knows together with everything in between. But more than that, the second part of verse 2 tells us he knows my thoughts or my intentions. Not only does God know every move we make, he knows the motive and the intention behind every move we make. Not just what I do, but why I do it. Sometimes I don't even know why I do certain things. <laughs> do you ever get that? <laughs> but the Lord does. He knows my thoughts. You can see why in the blurb in the Corrie News this week I said that God is bigger and greater than any box we could ever try to fit him in. He knows us completely. And all of this, David says, he does from afar. Not, I don't think, far from a distance. He's not a distant God watching on like the deists might believe and say, well, God created and then he stood back, wound the clock up and let it all go and just to observe it. No, his hand is upon us. He's acquainted with all of our ways. He is everywhere around us. And as we see in the next stanza, he's very close, always. So instead, this afar is not a reference to distance but more a reference to time which verse 4 explains for us, even before a word is on my tongue, he knows it. He knows it all together. He knows it completely. There is nothing the Lord doesn't know about us. Nothing. Now that fact, that truth, could make us feel a little awkward, perhaps a little uncomfortable, claustrophobic even. Stay with that thought for a moment because I actually think that's how David feels. Have a look at verse 5. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Now we might as believers assured in Christ might think of safety and security being surrounded and hemmed in by God's hand. And it might mean that but the, the word hem me in here actually is more literally you besiege me. You've surrounded me. You've enclosed me. And the word for hand here is not the usual word for hand. It actually refers to the cupped hand, this way or that way. And one scholar, Alan Roth, speaks of this being like cupping your hand over a moth on the table. It's trapped. It cannot escape. You might have good intentions about releasing it, but the moth doesn't know that. All it knows is that it can't get away. That's the image presented here. And this image, this divine knowledge of God is too wonderful for David. There's a lot of little word lessons here, but this word wonderful, we sort of use in a nice sense, don't we? The word here is more, this is just super, this is beyond comprehension. This is supernatural. This is extraordinary. It's, it's too big for me. It's uncomfortable, sort of incomprehensible. Knowing that God knows all of that about me and he knows it in such a manner that it hems me in and closes around me, he knows every thought and intention behind everything I do and say. If someone knew all of that about us, it would make us feel a little bit edgy, wouldn't it? Make us want to find somewhere to hide or somewhere private, away from Big Brother watching. Well, what if that someone was someone we didn't trust? might make us want to do something quite drastic to make sure that knowledge never got its way out into the open. 
Or worse still, what if we felt a little bit guilty in regards to some of that knowledge, the content of that knowledge that somebody else had about us? Consider Adam and Eve after eating the fruit in the garden they were told not to. When God came to them in the garden, what did they do? They looked for a place to hide and cover themselves from God's presence. Jonah tried to escape from God and flee from the presence of the Lord. In Revelation 6, the kings and the rulers, the rich and the powerful, as well as slaves and free, when the lambs open the sixth seal and they see the judgment and the wrath of God against all those who have opposed him, they hide themselves among the rocks and the caves and mountains and they call out to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us because we can't face the Lord. We don't want to see his face. Hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne. Well, what about the more perhaps godly characters confronted with God and his knowledge and holy presence? Isaiah, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips and I've seen my king, the Lord of hosts. Or Peter in the boat. Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. I'm a sceptic by nature and I'm especially sceptical of anyone or a story of someone who, who's had a near-death experience or some other vision of God and comes away all smiles as if it was just such a lovely and nice, wonderful sort of thing without any sense of awe or wonder and perhaps even fear. Because if we, as we read in the scriptures, to be confronted with the Lord and with his holiness and his powerful presence together with the fact that he knows everything about us should make us feel a little bit uneasy, if not a lot. It does for David. God knows me. He has this sort of knowledge about me. It's too much. It's too high, too, too lofty. I can't attain it. I feel quite small and even vulnerable under it. I'm not saying that as believers we shouldn't have assurance and confidence to approach the throne of grace. That is there for us to have in Christ. But even dear John, the disciple Jesus loved, when seeing Jesus in all his glory in the revelation, fell at his feet as though dead. But the awesome and amazingly wonderful thing about God who knows us is that he doesn't leave us in that uncomfortable state. In Revelation, John quickly hears those wonderful and comforting words from the lips of this one so holy and glorious. Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive evermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Adam and Eve heard similar words of comfort, of promise, although they may not have heard them in their guilt and shame. They may have heard them quite differently. Isaiah heard similar words and so did Peter. And so for us this morning, we might feel a little bit uneasy about God knowing us so intimately, so completely. There's no secret sins with God. He knows all of us. He knows all of each of us. Each of us completely. He knows our web browsing history. He knows our selfishness. He knows when we haven't loved. And if that evokes a bit of fear or anxiety, then that may not be a bad thing. But I ask and pray, don't run away and hide just yet. Wait and listen and I trust this morning you too will hear those words of comfort and promise from the Father. Don't be afraid. Yes, I know you completely and I am holy and I cannot stand sin but I know you as a father loves his son and knows his son and I know you in love and in grace. I know you that you might know me as father, merciful and gracious. But before we get there in the psalm at least, given that inescapable scrutiny and knowledge and presence of the Lord, David asks the question, can I get any privacy around here? Is big brother, or in this case big father, always watching? 
Where can I go to get away from you? He looks around, he knows the Lord and he knows there's nowhere to go, nowhere to escape, even if he did want to. Where shall I go from your spirit, in verse 7? Where shall I flee from your presence? And again he demonstrates what he means in that first verse with the next few. There is nowhere David can go, nowhere we can go to escape from the presence of the Lord and from his intimate detailed knowledge and scrutiny of his searching. Even if I went to the highest heaven, Lord, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, in the depths of hell, whatever David meant for that place at that time, even there you, that you are there. No matter how high or low I go, you are there. If I can't go up and down, what if I go east and west, follow the rising sun on the morning to the uttermost parts of the sea? No, he's there too. Well, what if I just stay put and wait for the darkness to hide me, to cover me, so dark that I cannot even see the hand in front of my face? But no, he's still there. In fact, the darkness is like light with God and night is as bright as the day and it's not because God eats his carrots. It's because his knowledge and his presence are divine. He is all-knowing, he is all-omniscient, if you want to use that word, but as I said, don't just make it academic. He's ever-present. He's in every place and every situation. He's not just in the volumes of systematic theology, using those big words, he's in our lives. His knowledge and his presence are real. We cannot escape him. In Jeremiah we hear God himself asking, Can a man hide himself in secret places that I cannot see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? So there's no escape. But here in verse 10 there's a slight shift now. Even there, in the uttermost parts of the sea, there your hand, this time the normal use of the hand, shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. No longer hemmed in or besieged, he is held by God's right hand, comforted and led by his strong, protective, mighty hand. The king, King David, who is after all like the rest of us, like a sheep that's gone astray, should he ever attempt to flee or escape from the presence of the Lord, would find himself actually wanting nothing but to be found by the Lord, to be led by him to safety and held by him securely. David knows what it is to flee danger. He's had to run from Saul. He's had to duck and weave from spears being thrown at him. He had to hide in a cave. He even had to hide among his own enemies, the Philistines, to get away from Saul. And he knows that in each and every one of those situations he needed the Lord and he knew the Lord was with him. And so in his meditations here perhaps he's found himself looking for a place to hide only to realise should he ever find a place it would be terrifying if the Lord would not be there. Not to have the presence and power of his all-knowing God with him. Like Isaiah who one minute cries out, woe is me, only finds himself the next saying, Lord, here I am, send me, I'll go for you, with you, you go with me. Or Peter in the boat saying, depart from me, O Lord. What does he do when he gets his feet on dry land? He doesn't run away. He leaves everything and follows him. Adam and Eve hid from the Lord. We spend so much of our time and energy and lives running and hiding from the Lord, looking for springs of water in other places other than the fountain of life, only to find that our only hope, our only security, our only comfort and joy is in him and with him. Many a child is afraid of the dark as they grow up, not wanting to go to bed, not wanting to try to go to sleep without a light on. But the scriptures tell us that those in the dark fear the light. They don't want it. They'd rather live in darkness than have the light. Why? Because the light exposes their deeds done in darkness. 
But friends, when that light comes, it comes in grace to us and we can receive it and live in it freely and we would never want to live in darkness again, would we? And we come to the third stanza in the psalm. We actually find ourselves in a dark place. Even before I was formed in the dark, secret, hidden depths of my mother's womb, even there you see me. More than that, David says, there you formed me. No wonder you know me so well. You made me there in that secret place. He's there. He knows us now because he, he's the one who made us. And this is not some superstitious spiritual ignorance about how babies are made. It's a wonderfully poetic but beautifully real and theological, in the best sense, statement of faith as to how we are formed and, and who it is who forms us. Far more than a mere biological phenomena of sperm and egg joining. It's an act of God. Your works are wonderful. My soul knows it very well. And he didn't just make our bodies, but our inward parts, our soul or spirit, as well as our bodies, created, knit together like that beautifully woven tapestry. Every detail carefully and particularly crafted. Every time I see a newborn, I just marvel at their fingernails. So tiny, but they're all there. God's tapestry at work. Yet none of us are the same. We're all different. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That word wonderfully, unfortunately, is actually different again to the, the first use of wonderfully. It means I've been made with distinction. I've been made uniquely. And I've been made with no mistakes. Set apart, each for the good purposes of God, each different but each with the same love and careful attention. David's no longer provoked to fear by God's knowledge and inescapable presence. He now rises to praise. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you. when I was being made in the secret place, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance, the fetus of David. God knew it, saw it, made it. God knew him, knew his days, written in God's book, even before he was a twinkle in Jesse's eye. There's no room for chance or karma. The mention of God's book tells us nothing's left to chance, nor does anything go unnoticed or unplanned by the Lord. It's written, engraved, through and through, thought through, considered, to be worked out in accordance with his will. Every day written in the Lord's book. We're about to kick off our, or recommence our study of Luke's Gospel starting next week with Brian Arthur coming to share with us. We're going to hear soon of Jesus sending 72 out to preach the gospel of the kingdom and they come back filled with joy because even the demons are subject to them in his name. And Jesus says to them, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And here's David, full of joy and praise, that his days and his name is written in heaven. And now the very thoughts of God are precious to him. Not just in theory, but in life. When David concludes his meditation, when he rises from his reflections, I'm still with you, your presence is still there. I haven't just gone off in some la-la land. I've been thinking these huge, big thoughts, too big for me to contain. And I rise from that and I'm still with you and you are still with me. Some people count sheep to try to get to sleep. David counts the thoughts of the Lord and rests in that. 
and when he wakes he knows God's presence. Perhaps here's a good place for us to jump forward a thousand years and then another two thousand for us today. If God didn't know us so completely, so intimately and with such foreknowledge and power, if he hadn't searched us, then how could Christ have died for our sins 2,000 years ago? Perhaps that's a bit of a speculative question, but one worth asking. Such knowledge could make us run and hide and try to flee from God. But if we know God, our maker and our judge, as our Father, merciful and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and knowing that he's actually acted on our behalf in accordance with that character of his, then such knowledge is sheer delight, isn't it? Where else can we go? Nowhere to flee, nowhere to hide. But everywhere we turn is not judgment but loving kindness. It's not condemnation but a gracious welcome into his presence and into his family. Yes, he knows us. Yes, he hems us in with his cupped hand laid upon us. But would you want to be besieged by any other hand other than one of grace? We just sang amazing words, really, the verse that we stood up to sing. Lord, sometimes your word cuts, it wounds us. But Lord, let us hear that word because it brings healing. In the end of Psalm 23, we're followed, pursued actually, by God in his goodness and mercy. It follows us all the days of our life. You want to turn and flee and run and hide from God, he will chase you down. But he will chase you down with his goodness and his mercy. And he will herd you into his house where we will dwell forevermore. James Packer writes, God's complete knowledge of us involves personal affection, redeeming action, covenant faithfulness, and providential watchfulness. His knowledge of us is salvation for us, now and forever. Now the sons of Korah stopped there, the end of verse 18. And it would be nice, it would be much easier if the psalm finished there too, but it doesn't. And so neither will we. We need to address the question, how does one fit this next stanza with the rest? And how can we, who have been told to love our enemies, pray a prayer as David prays here? It would be easy to think that such a beautiful psalm as this has been composed by David in a quiet moment of peaceful reflection, sitting on a beach or in the mountains, considering God and life, creation and God's blessings. But no, like many of his psalms, David has written this most likely in the presence of enemies, wicked, malicious God-haters. And they, they hate the one God has anointed as king because they hate God and so they hate David. And so David, who we know is a man after God's own heart, cries out in this beautiful psalm and it sort of comes out of the blue, doesn't it? Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Men of blood, depart from me. These are not just folk who are ambivalent about God and faith and such matters, nor are they just troublemakers trying to make life difficult or uncomfortable for David and God's people. These are wicked enemies, men of blood. They are murderous. They speak against God with malicious intent. They're trying to do damage to God and to his people. They take his name in vain. They're not just cursing God when they hit their thumb. They're actively pursuing the defamation of God and his holy name. They're enemies of God, haters of God. And given David's reflections in those first three stanzas, David himself says he hates those who hate God. He loathes them. He hates them with a complete hatred. These same people that God knows and has made and has formed have turned against him. But hate still seems such a strong word, doesn't it? David wants nothing to do with them. 
but we're told to love our enemies and to pray for them. And I think when Jesus said that in the context, I don't think he meant pray like this. Slay them, O Lord. (coughs) So what do we do with it? Do we just avoid it and finish the psalm? No. I think it's helpful here to consider some of the other words of Jesus, who at one time said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And so without taking away or diminishing any of the strength and the passion of David's words here, (coughs) after all we rarely have trouble cheering David on when he slays Goliath, do we? Which at the end of that in um, 1 Samuel David says, All this assembly will know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. Euphemism for saying the Lord will slay you and will do it with the very stone that I sling towards you and your own sword that I cut off your head with. But it's worth noting and again I borrow from Alan Ross here as we read through the scriptures, it can be helpful to understand that word hate essentially as shun or reject and then the word love to choose and accept. When Jesus said what he said, you must hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your wife, even your own life, straight after telling us to love our enemies, <laughs> what he means basically comes down to if it comes down to choosing between him and our family then we need to choose him and reject even our own family to renounce anything and anyone that would hinder us choosing to follow him. He said that verse in the context of the parable concerning those who were invited to a great banquet but at the time the banquet came each person made an excuse why they couldn't come. They had other agendas, other priorities and so they missed out on the banquet because they loved those things, they chose those things implication being they rejected or hated the banquet and the master of the banquet and the one holding it. And instead the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame were invited so that there was no room left. Loyalty to God means allegiance to him before any other. To count the cost is what Jesus says and renounce everything if need be to follow him. David here in the psalm doesn't hate these wicked people because they're a nuisance to him but because they're first of all enemies of God and therefore enemies of his. He's not squeamish as to turn away from asking the Lord to do the same as he did with Goliath, especially those who hate the Lord with malicious intent, who rise up against him and defile his holy name. His call here to the Lord against his enemies is not spite towards them. Despite his completeness of the hatred, it is actually zeal for the Lord. So often when we react to enemies, to troubles, we actually react in anger or spite, don't we? Calling for justice from the Lord because we want justice just for us. We want vengeance. But here, and as we should, David desires to uphold the Lord's holy name. And then David does what we so often fail to do. He goes one step further with his discernment and judgment of these God-haters and actually then submits himself to the same scrutiny, to the same mighty hand of God and the same searching eye. Search me, O God, and know my heart, my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. The word thoughts here is his anxious thoughts, the things he worries about, where he might lack faith. And this sort of bookends the psalm, doesn't it? Because how does it start? You have searched me and you've known me, but now David wants him to search him and know him. Lord, you already know everything about me, but I want you to search me and know me again and try me anyhow. See if there is anything grievous within me, anything offensive to you or to anyone else that would cause pain or suffering. David said, 
men of blood, depart from me. He wanted the wickedness and the evil not to be around him. He wanted to be purged of it. But it's not just the external wickedness he wanted to be purged, but anything internal as well. He submits himself to the same judgment. Lord, purge any evil thought or grievous way within me. Reminiscent of Psalm 51, isn't it? Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Lord, you do know me. You know my wayward ways as well as my so-called righteous ways. And I'm not always pure in heart or word or thought or deed. And so David concludes by praying, lead me, Lord, in the way everlasting. God doesn't need us to pray in order for him to know our thoughts and desires, does he? He knows us already completely, even before a word is on our lips in prayer. But we need to pray, acknowledging that God knows us, marvelling at his knowledge of us and his presence and confessing our own wayward ways and asking that the Lord would lead us in his ways. David's God is our God. He knows us with the same intimate, detailed knowledge and we cannot escape his presence. As I said before, there's no secret sins with God. They're all out in the open. The light comes and exposes the deeds done in darkness and even that darkness is as light to the Lord. And so any skeletons we might have in the closet, well, there's no use trying to hide them. And you see, God in his holiness and his righteousness cannot know all of this and do nothing about it. And so the question to ask isn't how much does God know or how much did I get away with, but what does God do with what he knows? And the wonderful news of the gospel is that how we once were as we read in Galatians. Formerly you were once like this. Fearful of God, knowing us like this. In fact, enslaved by our fear, enslaved by guilt and sin and the idols we use to soften the blow and look for some sort of satisfaction and joy and peace, only to get more and more entrenched and enslaved. And the gospel tells us, Jesus tells us, you were once like this, formerly, but no longer. The chains are off. Your heart's been set free. Your web browsing history is cleared without a trace. Better yet, your conscience has been cleansed of any guilt. Your record of debt cancelled completely cleansed, guilt-free, paid with the price of the blood of Christ who was sent as God's son to redeem those under law, you, me, David, so that we might receive adoption as sons. As I shared with the youth at the recent summer school, God's one of those housekeepers who doesn't let you come in without wiping your feet. Or worse, you know, sometimes you've got to take your shoes off. You might be one of those people. You can't walk in with your shoes on. God doesn't let one bit of grit or dusty sin come into his family home. And he cannot simply sweep it under the divine rug in heaven. But he wants you to come in. And he knows all the filth and muck. But he wants you to be part of his family. The holy creator of the universe knows every minute and intimate detail about us. And that makes his love for us all the more amazing. True holy love isn't blind. You know we hear that little phrase, love is blind, it's not. True love does not turn a blind eye to sin. True holy love cannot turn a blind eye to sin. But instead, true holy love and grace redeems and it justifies and it sanctifies and it sheds blood for us.
That's God's knowledge of us to the absolute depths. All of that so that we might come into his family. We who formerly did not know God, enslaved to those by nature who were not God's, but now have come to know him. Or rather, says Paul, almost correcting himself but actually telling us the priority of the order of things, we are now known by God. How can you turn your back again, he asks the Galatians, to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the word? Why do you want to go back to the darkness when the light has come? Do you want to be slaves again? No. Lord, no. Father, no. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Lord, if there is any grievous way in me. O Lord, if it's there, just cut it out. Get rid of it. Have mercy on me. Do away with it by the blood of your Son. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen.